And then the next day, um, I'm going on an ammo run, and um, we got ambushed uh, with Chicom. They were throwing grenades. The two guys in front of me got blown in half, and I got wounded, knocked unconscious um, mm. the second or third day of the operation. And we're rolling. How's it going, RJ? I'm doing, doing fine, Josh. Thank you for being here, sir. My, my pleasure. Um, how about this start off, just uh, introduce yourself. Tell us your name, uh, the branch of service, and the years you served. Yeah, yeah RJ Jackson, uh, United States Marine Corps, uh, 1966, 1968. And what was your job? I was a scout sniper. Of course, in the Marine Corps, you're all 0311 grunts, but mm -hmm. uh, my real title was a, a 8541 scout sniper. Wow, wow. Um, let's just start off with, uh, uh, talk to me about uh, where are you from and what was your upbringing like? Yeah, my uh, parents, we were in Los Angeles. I was born in 1947. I was the, the youngest of five. I had two brothers and two sisters. And my father had come to California to join uh, the military in the 40s, but he had health issues and couldn't do it. And we lived in a, an area called Glassell Park near Atwater mm. in Los Angeles. And I grew up on the same street, mm. uh, West Avenue 33, pretty much till I was 17 years old. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, so you were with both parents growing up? Yes. Yeah. My, my father uh, had a family and children prior to my mother and he getting together. And, uh, and my mother, I was, I was an only child of my mother, but I had the two brothers and two sisters that my father had. Mm. So um, what, what inspired you to go into the Marine Corps? Well, uh, as history, my, I had my two older brothers are 13 years and 11 years older than I am, uh, respectively. And they were in the Marine Corps in the 50s after the Korean War. They were peacekeeping times. They were in Korea and also in Japan. And uh, it was just something that uh, it was instilled in me. I saw how they were. And my eldest brother got injured in training. It was in Balboa Hospital in San Diego. And mm. we drove down every Saturday to go see him. Oh, wow. And that was really the main driving force to, to be in the Marine Corps. Mm. What happened to them in training? They were having uh, hand grenade training, and somehow a live one got involved, and he was, next to a, he was adjacent to a tank. Ooh. And it bounced off, and, and he had his, left, his face was scarred, and his left side and his leg. Oh, wow. He was in the hospital probably three months, I believe, on, on his recovery. Oh, wow. That's unfortunate. Yeah. Um, so uh, what was boot camp like? And uh, when did you go to boot camp? Boot camp, uh, October of 1966. Yeah. So when you went in, did you, uh, uh, did you get to pick your job? No. Uh, actually, they, at the time during Vietnam, they had uh, what was called a delay program to join. They mm. didn't have boot camps open, but you did a 90-day delay program. So I actually signed up in August of 1966. But uh, they load you on the bus down at the induction center. They dropped you off downtown San Diego, and the DI showed up in the bus. Hmm. And the rest uh, is just uh, grueling for, for nine weeks. Yeah. And, yeah. But, but during boot camp, they had interviews. They, you did testing. Hmm. And I suppose they used that for some kind of criteria for what your assignment, your MOS is going to be. Hmm. So did they, did they select you to be a scout sniper or did you try out for that? Uh, I shot expert. I shot uh, in the 230s. With the, at the time, we were qualifying with M14s. Mm -hmm. And uh, following boot camp, then we had uh, basic infantry training, and then we had advanced infantry. And following that, we were getting prepared to go to Vietnam. And a sergeant came in from the sniper school and took the top four in our, in our platoon and mm -hmm. told us we had an opportunity to be, to be scout snipers. It mm -hmm. was actually the second class since the Korean War is what we attended. Oh, wow. And, and so then you, then you go off to... Scout sniper school? Yeah, it was really, it was on base in Pendleton. I, I believe it was four weeks. Okay. And uh, I had never shot a high powered rifle, never shot a rifle with a scope. Mm. And, uh, but I had still nerves. And uh, I, I did, well, I shot a perfect score actually in the, at nice. the, uh, the qualifying and great training, uh, all the way from range finding and distance and the winds and aperture and all that. Mm. It was just incredible short training. Mm. So when you get done with Scout Sniper School, then what, did you get stationed somewhere or what ended up happening after that? Well, after that, they had what they, they set up a jungle training area for, um, for Vietnam, mm -hmm. and, uh, which was somewhat effective. And after that, then it was uh, go to El Toro and catch a flight on to uh, Okinawa uh, and give some blood and then get to uh, Da Nang you know, for our assignment. Mm. You signed up 
wanting to go to combat or? Yes, I, I knew it was. I had a, a friend in high school I played baseball and basketball with, and he was killed um, oh. in uh, February of 1966, and that resonated with me. And, um, and we were shooting pool in Glendale. We go downstairs, and the next door they had the recruiter, Marine recruiter, and there was a sign that said, two-year enlistment's now available. And I walked in, and I, I told the recruiter, I'll take, I'll take that. And then he signed me up, and the rest was uh, waiting for the boot camp to open up on mm. October 6th. Mm. What, did your, uh, what did your parents and your, your brothers think about you going in at this time? Um, I didn't tell anyone um, uh -huh. how I worked it. I sold my car and bought a motorcycle for the summer. And um, I asked a friend to drive me to the induction center downtown. And I didn't tell him where we were going. And nobody knew, actually, any friends, family, or anybody knew in, until um, they got letters from me from boot camp. Really? <laughs> so, so your family just received letters like, oh, crap, RJ's in the Marines. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah, my, I, my father asked me to leave when I was 14, and it was a, a strained relationship. Mm. But um, I, I managed to you know, work through that, get through high school, play a little baseball uh, at uh, L.A. State uh, yeah. when I was a freshman. But then uh, I, I, felt, I felt the need with everything going on with the friend that had passed mm -hmm. uh, in, in combat. Um, it was a natural decision for me with my brother's history. Yeah. Um, so talk to me about that. What was it like? Uh, what was your experience like going into Vietnam? Yeah, it's, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we go from El Toro to Okinawa. That was the first time I'd ever been on an airplane. I didn't know where Vietnam was on a map. Never had that in history class. And, but we landed in Da Nang, and you, we were in a great big Quonset area, tented area, and for hours they were reading off the names, and when they called my name out, um, 8541 Scout Sniper, um, the, the staff sergeant said, okay, get on a truck, go to the Y on the road, jump off, and wait for the next truck to take you out to regimental headquarters, which I was assigned to. Oh, wow. First impression was... Uh, was interesting yeah. at best. I had, I had one magazine of ammo and, and an, M, and an M, M16. Wow, wow. So, um, and when you finally get to what, where you're going, uh, what happens from there? Well, they had the snipers in the regimental headquarters. They had, we had our own hooches and we had our, we had our sign out front, um, Grim Reapers, Knights of Death, mm -hmm. in which I figured that was appropriate. But there was really, there was no indoctrination, no introduction. It was here, you're sleeping there. And within three or four days, I was going on the first operation. I wasn't the lead sniper. I was a scout, and mm. my partner was from Detroit, and, and his name was Harlan Carter. He uh, actually led our team. Mm. And the first, first operation was Operation uh, Union 2, which was uh, in the Chulai area, which was one of the toughest ones we, we had ever gone into. Really? What, what unit were you with? I went with, we were with 1st Marine Battalion, uh, Charlie Company, uh, and primarily the whole time I was in Vietnam, I worked in 1st Battalion, and, and I was more or less adopted by, by the, uh, the officers within uh, Charlie Company. Mm -hmm. We all worked well together, and it was a good comfort level. Yeah. So the, you said the mission was called Union 2? Union 2. Yeah. Um, talk to me about that. What was that like? It was... Uh, in. As a, as, a, as, a, as a boot, I had still had leather, leather boots, I didn't have jungle utes, and I had two magazines of M16 ammo. That was what they gave me. Mm -hmm. But uh, as I learned historically, what was happening was the Green Beret had been surrounded in the Chu Lai area, and First Marines were going in to, to uh, break through and, and rescue them. But it was uh, pretty much from the time we were out there, there was, there was, uh, there was battle. Mm. And, wow. uh, um, how old were you at this point? I was 19. 19. Uh, do you recall the, the first time you got contact, uh, got into contact with the enemy? Yeah, it was a, um, it was, it was called a killer patrol mm -hmm. and they were laying mines out. Um, we knew that. And so, um, as scout snipers, we'd go out with, with another team, with the machine gun team, be six of us total. And, uh, we, we got to a berm and then we saw them, they were actually laying the laying the, the mines, they had their AKs swung over, and uh, we, we took them out without casualty. Mm. Wow. Um, how, how did it, how did that, uh, do you recall how you felt at that point? Like, you know, you're 
you know, you're, you're young and you're like in the middle of Vietnam and, you know, now, you know, you're realizing, yeah, you're really in combat. Yeah, it's um, the first battle, Union 2, there were, you were shooting, but you may have hit something, but ne may not necessarily know you did it. Mm. Well, this was a little bit different. We could almost see the whites of their eyes and, and uh, we were successful and I was successful on my target. Mm. And, but the sergeant looked at me, I couldn't, I was lying, lying down, the sergeant said, uh, you gotta be careful what you're doing because you were doing stuff that's a little bit dangerous mm. and, and you don't have an S on your chest. But uh, I couldn't sleep the first night. Um, uh, I got over that very quickly, though, because we were regularly we were in, we were in some kind of skirmish or or search and destroy. Yeah. What was it? Uh, uh, so were you just constantly going on missions every day, patrols, or? No. Um, there were sometimes there were there were company operations, battalion operations, but generally it would be a smaller unit. Um, and they had what they called a scorpion. We'd go out with maybe a platoon. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then later in the day, we would set, would settle in. And right before, right before dusk, um, they would leave. The, most people would leave. They'd leave my partner and I in, in, uh, in a machine gun team. Mm. And we were the tail of the scorpion. Usually people think the scorpion's head is scary, but it's the tail that's going to get you. So. Right, right. Um, did you ever get to utilize your uh, uh, sniper skills in Vietnam? Yes. Yeah, how so? Um, well, it, again, we'd go out the, we, we were fortunate. We had a Colonel, Lieutenant Bell. It was very famous. They, they called him Ding Dong. <laughs> but he would call us in, even at 19 years of age, I'd go in with my partner and he'd tell us what he wanted. And it, we were actually scout snipers and they sent us out on reconnaissance and, uh, charting, and charting things. And um, uh, the goal was, was to get intelligence mm. and secondarily if we got a shot take the shot mm. but several times we'd go out we the shots weren't were practical yeah. but there were there were several times that we'd be able to be in a position to where we we had three or four ways of escape and and we'd take our shot confirm kill mm. and then and then go back wow and were you doing this with an m16 still or did you have a no it's a remington 700 mm. it was a uh, it was a 308 and it was nine power. We had a red field scope. You know, mm -hmm. today's scopes are far superior, but we had a three to nine variable red field, yeah. bull barrel, floating stock, and match ammunition. And we had to keep that dry and clean. Every night we had to, we, we had to massage the, the rounds and wow. make sure they were clean. Wow. Um, how long did you spend in uh, Vietnam? One year. One, one year, one yeah. tour? Yeah, one tour. Okay. Um, uh, what other missions do you recall in uh, Vietnam? What stands out to you? Yeah, um, we had gone, we'd gone from south of Da Nang and, and they flew us up to Dong Ha, which is at the DMZ. Mm. And then we came south and then we were on an Operation Medina in October mm. of 67. And um, really, we didn't have much intelligence, but it was the Ho Chi Minh Trail. There was a triple canopy force. They couldn't take aerial shots. Um, there was really, it was um, just trailblazing. Mm -hmm. And we were there with, uh, it was with Charlie Company, Delta, and then I think there were some second marine uh, platoons or companies there. And um, the first day was just making our way through. There was machete. We were, my partner and I were considered the, the, the point of the spear. We were number three and four back on the front. And uh, we got down on a trail and then, and then opened, we were ambushed. Um, the whole, the whole group got ambushed and oh, wow. the two in front of us got killed. And my partner, Rod Lewis and I, we jumped over, there was a log, we jumped over the trail into the, over the log and, uh, and spent uh, pretty much half the night there until we rallied. Oh, wow. Um, this was Operation Medina? Yes. Yeah, you were telling me about that earlier, right? Uh, yeah. In the, uh -huh. in the book. Oh, man. Um, and what was the mission for this? The, the, the mission was that there was uh, allegedly there were battalions as uh, a training area mm -hmm. and where the NVA would North Vietnamese Army, the, the communists would come down and they would train the local, the Viet Cong. And they had munitions and they had it was almost it was a it was a boot camp that they had. And uh, so we knew we'd made contact, obviously, but we didn't know where we didn't know what the force was. And then during the night. Um, we were, he and my partner and I were still behind the log, separated from everybody. And then um, the captain Jack Ruff, or it was Lieutenant Jack Ruffer, 
started singing the Marine Corps hymn. It was pitch black. We didn't know where anybody was until then. And at first we thought it was the enemy uh, trying to get us uh, to, to give our position away. Oh, wow. And uh, we got up and walked and found the crew. We set up our perimeter. And then the next day, um, going on an ammo run, and um, we got ambushed uh, with Chicom. They were throwing grenades. The two guys in front of me got blown in half, and I got wounded, knocked unconscious. Um, mm. The second or third day of the operation. Oh, wow. How long did the operation last? Um, I was involved about four or five days, and I think it, it went another three or four days after that. We had the reinforcements had to come in, and um, they did body counts, and, and we succeeded in, in prevailing, but it was, uh, it, it was tough going. Yeah. And they, found, they did find the, um, the cache of weapons, and they, they found ammo, and and uh, further back, they found there was actually trails where trucks could drive on. Mm. But where we'd been ambushed initially, it was just a, it was a footpath. Yeah. When you, uh, when you uh, got hit with that grenade, did you, uh, what, what injuries did you sustain? Did you get shrapnel or what happened? Yeah, I got shrapnel in my, my, my hand, my arm, my shoulder, my chest, and, and uh, concussion. Mm. And um, I'd looked up, and they were coming. It was down a slope. They were, the, the enemy was coming down. And but because they thought I was dead, they were shooting over me. And then we got superiority, we got the firepower, and a corpsman yelled at me to come on down, you know, try to get to his position because there was a trench. Mm. And I told him no, and he said, why not? He said, because they're not shooting at me. I stayed there another half hour, 45 minutes, making sure that I wasn't, I wasn't going to make the fatal mistake. Yeah. So you just stood there, you're playing dead, essentially, it sounds like. Yeah, my arm, I thought I lost my left arm because it was underneath me. I couldn't feel it because I had nerve damage and um, my weapon was away from me. But the ears, you know, it was perforated eardrums as it turned out um, from the Chicom. And Chicom grenades, they put everything in it, everything metal, and it's mm. very devastating. They kept it on them. How close did they get to you? Uh, 40 or 50 feet. Wow. Yeah, looking up at and I, I... To this day, I, I know they were Chinese because they were too big for Vietnamese. Really? Yeah. And, and, they, and the lieutenant confirmed that later on. Really? Wow. Is that, was that a common thing? No. No. Further north you went towards DMZ could be likely, but I'd never heard. At, until that point, it was just uh, Viet Cong and, and, our, and, and the Republic of Vietnam. Wow. Um, so what, what, did, uh, what did they do with you after that? Uh, after your, eventually, obviously, you're able to move and get. Yeah, I, I could, I could walk, and they, and they staged me that night. There was no, we had no LZ. Everything was taken and captured, and so the next day they started bringing medevacs in, and we had a, we had a trail that we all laid at, and uh, they got us all out, and the most serious first, and I wasn't the most serious, mm. so they put us on the little, little grasshoppers and got us out. Mm. And then I imagine you went to clinic or something, medical facility. Yeah, I was, I was transported uh, to Da Nang, which okay. is south where we were, Da Nang, and, and uh, spent, I think, four or five days. They were making sure all the shrapnel was out and the, the nerve damage they wanted, to, they were a little concerned about, but it managed, it all healed pretty good. Yeah. How, uh, uh, how long had you been in Vietnam when that happened? Right at five, six months. Yeah. So then you, so you eventually recovered and went back out? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. they recycle. Wow, really? Yeah. Was that a common thing in Vietnam? Yeah. Uh, they, they had a rule. Um, two, if you're wounded two times and you're, you're taken care of for 48 hours each, that's, the, that's the, the two 48 hours. And then they won't put you back in the field. But I, um, I had the one and then in, I was in Tet Offensive in Way in, in February and I got wounded there. Mm. My second. Uh, Again, you got wounded? Yeah, my second opportunity, yeah. Oh, what happened there? Well, the, the, if you're familiar, the Tet Offensive happened. It was the last of, of, the last of January of 1968, and it was all over the country. Every, it was synchronized. And, and um, we were at, how we got to Fubai was that there was a, um, a Coast Guard ship that got, got uh, uh, taken by the North Koreans. Mm -hmm. And they were staging first Marines to go to North Korea. They told us to send home for all clothes that can keep us warm. Mm -hmm. And we were waiting in Fubai to, to actually fly, fly to North Korea. 
or fly to South Korea and then, and then take the ship back. But in the meantime, uh, the Tet Offensive broke out and nobody knew what it was. It, it was everybody was talking about it and we couldn't, we couldn't chop her in because of the fog. The fog was, the air was too thick. Mm -hmm. But on February 1st, I think it was, we, we actually went down trucks and we went into, into way into the new city. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we were there, I, was thinking, I think I was there 24 days and it lasted a little bit longer than that. Wow. And what was it called? A Tet, T-E-T, -T. That's, that's the Chinese New Year. Oh, okay. And it was a Tet Offensive, but it was coordinated up and down the country. Hmm. They, they had built uh, armament, uh, they had tunnels. Uh, Saigon got hit really hard, Da Nang. And then Wei, um, the Wei had the Citadel, which was, that was the religious capital mm -hmm. of Wei. That was the old city. And they took that over. And then we were across the river, and then we were, um, once we had some aerial, we had some, some uh, gunships could come in after, after the clouds got away. But my partner and I, would, we were going street to street, door to door. It was, um, we'd never been, never trained or never had had door to door building fighting. Mm. So it was just one, sometimes one building at a time, sometimes yeah. 50 yards. And, and then we would, uh, we, we set up a site at a, it was by the water treatment and they had a tower and he and I set up there, my partner and I, I was the lead. And we had uh, shots into the, into the other side of the, of the river. Mm. where the bridge has been taken down. You went from jungle warfare to urban warfare. Yes, yeah, it was, uh, it was interesting because you didn't know every, every place you went, there were doors and there were hideouts. And actually the water commissioner of way we found his uh, NVA, his North Vietnamese Army communist uniform. Oh, wow. And we really? captured him and took him back for interrogation. But he didn't make it. Mm. Um, how did you end up getting wounded? Well, we were staging, they, they had uh, the enemy had taken an Antos from, from the, uh, the South, South Vietnam Army. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a six-gun six uh, recordless rifle, 106. And so the lieutenant, we were, we were in, a, in a building that was secure, and he was telling us to get the high ground and take it out, take, take him out. And there was an explosion, and a shrapnel came through and, and hit me in the right calf. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't know what it was. I felt warm. Yeah. And the corpsman was going to put a tourniquet on us. No, you're not. We just put pressure on it. <laughs> so that, I wasn't disabled at that time. Mm. And so since that was your second time, did you, did you have to leave Vietnam? Well, it took, it took two days to bring the chopper in to get me. But I actually, it was, it was, I found out later on, but it was, a, it was a white helicopter, you know, it was a turbo. And I found out later on it was the CIA. I was the only one on it. They flew out. They flew me out to Da Nang mm -hmm. and did some triage stuff on it. And then they flew me, to, I went down to Cameron Bay, Air Force Base Hospital. And I was the only Marine wow. that was there. I was there about two or three weeks because they, they had to leave the plug in the leg for the drainage and try to get the shrapnel out. Oh, wow. Um, what kind of things did you, uh, uh, did you, did you have much downtime out there in Vietnam? Yeah, there were times, uh, and particularly during the monsoons. Yeah. Um, I remember Christmas of, of 67, uh, we were uh, at the um, battalion headquarters and we, we had the concertina up and had, had all the watch out and everything. And, but um, it just poured rain for, for about two weeks. And it was during the time that they were doing the Paris peace talks. Mm -hmm. And when it started, less, the rain let up a little bit, then they sent us on per patrol just to go out and check the perimeters. But because of the Paris peace talk, and the, uh, and, the, and the politicians, they told us we couldn't, leave the, we couldn't leave the perimeter with a round in the chamber. It had to be safety on and no round in the chamber. Oh, wow. But, but when, as soon as we got 50 yards out of the, everybody was cranking one in the chamber and, and, and <laughs> safety was off. Yeah, yeah. But the, during, the high, during the high rains, even their side, there was nothing, you couldn't see anything. Mm. There, were some, there were some battles, but not, not many when it was really yeah. torrential downpour like that. You couldn't see anything. What, uh, what, what kind of things uh, would you do during that time, during your downtime, to pass the time? Stay dry. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we'd, we'd have the, um, make our own little tents and make sure it was trenched properly. Mm -hmm. You know, clean the weapons and, and uh, it wasn't much to do really. Yeah. It was, uh, you know, a week or two of just, you know, wringing out your underwear and your socks and <laughs> yeah. 
trying to stay as dry as you can. Um, uh, were you able to, uh, did you guys receive mail out there? Uh, yes. So yeah. you, did you, were you communicating back and forth with your family or anybody while you were out there? Yeah, it, um, in particular, when we were south and we were by Da Nang and Chu Lai and, and uh, Barrier Island and that, yeah, you'd be out. If you're out there long enough, then the, there'll be a mail call. Mm. They, they'd bring the mail, but usually it stacks of five, six, seven days. Mm. And, um, and then if you're in the rear area, I went back to the rear area not very often, regimental. Because there was nothing to do there, you know. It's I, I was more comfortable with the battalion and the and Charlie Company, but in the rear area you, you got mail really regularly. Yeah. And I and you get a C ration box and you write a note and just put free on it and the, they, that's how it got delivered. Mm. They take it and air mail to San Francisco and distributed. And you just write free. <laughs> free. Yeah. They got it. You know they C ration. You know they knew it was coming from a marine. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what kind of food did you eat out there? Um, in the field? Yeah. Sea, sea rations. Yeah. What, what, what did they Korean have? War sea rations. Oh, really? Yeah. What, I, what did those have in them? Uh, cans of beef steak or ham. Um, uh, ham and lima beans. We had another name for it. Uh, <laughs> um, they'd have fruit cocktail. They'd have some kind of fruit. They'd have a thing of peanut butter or cheese. Okay. And always a, a hard, hard piece of bread. And, after a while, we learned how to just open the can a little bit, put a little water in, and, and get C4 and heat the can up, and it would soften the bread. It was really good. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, make sandwiches. You get real creative, huh? Had to. Yeah. It sounds like they weren't much. Uh, uh, you know, I, was, I, I wanted to know just to compare you know, the MREs that we got. Uh, they're so advanced now. They come with Skittles yeah. and all kinds of crap now. So yeah. I, was, I was just curious. No, it, we did actually, yeah, we were getting this, the... Uh, the Holdover from Korean War, and uh, but they had spaghetti. I mean, you got truthfully, you got used to it. The yeah. only time you got, we rarely had chow in the field. You know, hot chow. Yeah. I know the army sometimes they got their caravans of food and mess mm -hmm. hall. We we got sea rations, and then we ate at battalion or regimental. We'd get we get a meal. Yeah, yeah. Um, did you uh, did you lose any close friends while you were out there? Uh, yeah, yes, yeah. It's um, actually it was a. Uh, he was a cook mm. um, at regimental, and he wanted, and he was a good shot. So he went and convinced him to let him go out, and and then he went up first operation. I had to identify his body in the in the in the cooler room. He oh. got hit right between the eyes. First first operation, huh? Yeah, he um, yeah he never yeah he was a little bit older. I'd say older, probably thirty. <laughs> yeah, at the time, and and. Um, and then there was, uh, uh, there was one, uh, uh, Corporal Day, um, he stepped on a mine and lost everything, oh, you man. know, below his waist. What was the first guy's name? I don't, I can't remember his name. He, he, was, he was a cook. He was someone that we helped orient to the war rifle on that, but I yeah. don't recall his name. He had been a, in the mess hall. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so uh, did you... That second time that you got wounded, is that did, did you end up going back out, or was that it? Um, from Cameron Bay, they, took, they sent me back to Fubai. Mm -hmm. That's where the first, first Marines was located. Mm -hmm. And um, I was, at that time, Marines had 13 months of tour duty. And I had, there may have been 30 days left of that. Mm. And uh, they decided to send me back to Okinawa, because they couldn't. It, technically, they couldn't. And I, and I was still limping. I had... Uh, I had damage in my right calf, and yeah. so they flew me to Okinawa, and um, and I was going to be there. They were going to make me a, a clerk typist for a while, mm. but then they came up and said, "No, we have a flight going out. Get ready, pack your stuff. We're going to get you back to Kanas." Mm. Um, any other uh, uh, stories that stand out uh, to you from uh, that tour in Vietnam? Well. Well, there's a lot. There's a series of stories, but it just it was just seemed like one continual saga. It's just from the time you get there until you leave, you're counting the days. Mm -hmm. it, it was just uh, um, a lot of guys had short timers calendars real early. Mm. But uh, no, it was the camaraderie was good, especially when I was with Charlie Company. Yeah, it was just we knew each other. We had each other's back, mm -hmm. um, and there was no um, there was no messing around. It was very serious. Yeah. I know a lot of stories come back that everybody was doing cocaine and marijuana. Our unit didn't. I never oh, yeah. did. 
Um, and I suspect there was, but yeah. um, what we did, you, you couldn't go out. You couldn't, you couldn't do what you were doing and, and be limited like that. Yeah. So you, we made sure everybody's very careful. Mm. We took care of each other, watched out for each other as well. Yeah, I've had heard stories about that, uh, you know, uh, coke and heroin and all that stuff to keep people going. But. Yeah, no, it just, um, it, maybe when they were down by Da Nang, you know, you go to China Beach or something, but uh, our group, you know, we, we took it really seriously yeah. and um, respected what we were doing. Um, so when you got back uh, uh, from Vietnam, did you get, did you get promoted uh, out there at all? No, I went over as a PFC and came back as a PFC. Really? <laughs> um, the, tr the problem was, was that I was technically assigned to 1st Regiment, mm -hmm. but I was working with 1st Battalion. Mm. And, and so I was out of sight, out of mind. I never worried about it. They were going to put me up, the lieutenants in the field were going to put me up meritorious stuff, and I'd just go do my thing. And, and then when I got out, I got back to Pendleton. They said, how come you're still a PFC? I said, look at my record. I didn't have any problems. Yeah. And so got, I made Lance Corporal <laughs> before my second year's up. Oh, yeah. So, it, so is that what you got out at E3? Yeah, E3, E3. Wow. They, they offered me, because um, I, tested, I tested really high, they offered me an opportunity for OCS because mm -hmm. you had to be 20 and a half. Mm. And I was. And um, they told me, and I said, well, tell me about it. I said, well... You go to OCS and you get out your your lieutenant, mm -hmm. and um, I said, "Well, what do you do then?" He said, "Well, you get trained and then you go to Vietnam." I said, "So let me get this straight. I'm training to be a lieutenant to go back to Vietnam." Yes, I said, "I'll tell you later." You know, I never got back to the captain. Yeah. Um, was... <laughs> how long? Did, how long uh, did you stay in the Marines after that? You got back. Um, I got back. I got back the day Martin Luther King was killed. Oh, wow. And I was in the cab. We were flying from Norton Air Force Base, or driving from Norton Air Force Base to um, El Toro for about four months. Four months. I had four months in yeah. stateside, and then uh, I got out on August, August 30th. Mm. So uh, what, what made you uh, decide to get out? Uh, did you have anything lined up, or were you just over it, done? I had uh, I'd gone, I had three semesters of college before I went in. I was still 18. I, I graduated high school very young. And I put in for a school uh, deferment, not deferment, an early out. Mm -hmm. I was going to Pasadena City College. I enrolled, okay. and I was, gonna get, I was just going to go back and get my grades up so I'd go to a four-year school. So I got on a, on a school. So you got out and went to Pasadena City College? Yeah. Uh -huh. So... I just can't imagine, uh, you know, what's it like having gone through that, you know, uh, everything that you went through in Vietnam, and then all of a sudden you're sitting in a class full of college students. Yeah. Well, the first day, um, they had a student area. There was where they all gathered, and I heard a megaphone or big uh, bullhorns and that, and I, I went to the crowd because there were young ladies there, and so I was going to go see, you know, what everybody looked like. and. Mm -hmm. I got there and they were hanging a soldier in effigy in the courtyard. Mm. And uh, then I basically did the moonwalk and got away and that affected me adversely. So I'd stayed to myself as the school was related. Mm. Uh, I had my core of friends, I had my tribe yeah. you know, that I, I hung with, but uh, that was uh, disturbing. That was my first touch with, uh, yeah. with how they felt about us. Right, right. Um... What was the transition like for you, you know, back in the civilian world? Uh, it was difficult, but I know that it's not as difficult as some of the guys had because I, I stayed in sports. Mm -hmm. I, I played baseball. I played on a semi-pro team. I, uh, went to, I went to Cal State Northridge and was going to play on, on their team. Nice. And so I stayed active. I played basketball, played church leagues basketball, industrial league basketball. Mm -hmm. Uh, and go to the beach. I had a job, but go to the beach, play volleyball. So I stayed active physically. Mm -hmm. Go to the gym a little bit. In those days, there there wasn't like the gyms you have now. Mm -hmm. And uh, but keep my mind, my mind still, and my body working. Were you uh, were you living on your own at this point? Yes. Okay, so you got out and you got your own place. Well, I had a family that um, I had lived with before I went in mm -hmm. that wanted me to stay there while I was adjusting. Okay. And it really worked out well. They were a nice family and uh, had my own room, come and go as I wish. No ob you know, obligation other than to be neat you know, and not make a mess. And, and then uh, after that, I, I, um, I went to Cal State Northridge for a while. Yeah. And then 
I sold a car, went to Hawaii, stayed there six months, worked, and enrolled at University of Hawaii. But uh, I, got a, I got a message from my mother. My father was dying, went back to L.A. Mm. And uh, at that time, uh, he, he wasn't. She just wanted to chase me back. And I'd been not really in touch with them for a long time. And then my brother in Missouri, the one that the oldest brother was in the Marine Corps, he told me to come back and go to school there and stay with him. So I did that mm. from uh, 70 to 71. Okay. Um, do you feel like uh, do you feel like you were a changed person from uh, before joining the Marines uh, to to you know uh, getting out? Yes. Um, and did you did you notice anything uh, maybe catching up to you? Like you know, I, I talked to a lot of combat vets that you know after being in combat like that uh, they have difficult times sleeping. Uh, you know, just you know all the stuff, just doing different things. Did, uh, were you experiencing any of that? Yes. Yeah, I had I. I, I couldn't sleep, yeah. and I know a lot of guys have the recurring dream, the same one, and mm -hmm. I just had flashbacks, I, and I, it, it would startle me, uh, noises, um, mm. cars backfiring, and, yeah. and all that kind of stuff, but, but uh, I managed that. I, I, I looked at it, I was, kind of, I was in good control, but I knew, I knew I had a lot of things that I needed to work on, mm. and, um, but absolutely I had more confidence yeah having gone through the training the Marine Corps tr training obviously mm -hmm. and survived what we survived right. and um, I had a lot of confidence there's really nothing I couldn't do I wasn't gonna jump off a cliff think I could fly but <laughs> but uh, yeah but they instilled that those leadership skills and uh, you know everything you accomplished yeah. just I mean just becoming a marine in and of itself <laughs> yeah right uh, um, so what did you do with those skills? Did you? Uh... Yeah, the when I got out, I got out in '68, and then in September of of '68, I got a letter from the city of Los Angeles uh, Police Department, and they wanted me to be a part of their counterinsurgency team. And at mm. the time, there was racial issues, and there were pending riots, and and uh, I thought about it because I I didn't I didn't have a good job, but I didn't want to jump from Vietnam to you know, sniper rifle in, in the city. Mm. And so I, um, I, I didn't do that, but I eventually uh, moved to San Diego and, and became a police officer mm. and, uh, in 1972. Nice. Um, and you did that for a little while, right? Yes, five years. And then what happened there? Um, I was on SWAT. I, I, I was jumping through the ranks, and I had my sergeant's exam um, on, on the seat next to me. I was working graveyard, and I was taking a, transporting a, a, a young boy home that had been siphoning gas, and, and he told me, he says, please don't take me to juvenile hall. I go, why? He said, you take me home, my father's a Marine, and, and he's gonna beat me. I said, what's your address? So I'm taking him on the 805 North, and I was hit head on by a drunk driver under, under drugs, and she was trying to commit suicide. Mm. And my car caught on fire, and my body was hurt. Oh wow! Severely. Wow, and then you ended up uh, retiring out out from that. Yeah, that was August of uh, August of seventy six, and they retired me in April of seventy seven, mm -hmm. and they just didn't. There was no light duty. I I couldn't. I could rehab to where I could walk, but I I couldn't be a beat cop, and they wouldn't. They wouldn't let me do anything. The city wouldn't allow. Police department would have. Yeah. But the city uh, refused. So from that, I went. I became the first probate uh, investigator for the um, for San Diego County. Oh wow! And uh, that was interesting. I got to interview uh, people that have been put under conservatorships and guardianships. I was investigating attorneys and the mistreatment and all that. It was very interesting, very enriching when you when you got got some results on the yeah on the effort from your investigations. Yeah. Wow. How long did you do that? Did it uh, right about four years. Mm -hmm. And then what did you do after that? Well, then I, I, um, I had an opportunity to go to uh, Nevada, Las Vegas, but for the state uh, game control board, the gambling commission. And a friend of mine from San Diego PD that had retired, he was there. And so I interviewed and they hired me. And mm. I did that for three years. And the last two undercover, uh, the covert, um, primarily with, with organized crime, we were, yeah. we were doing some stuff with the feds. Yeah. 
um, because they they organized crime. You you were mentioning they ran the casinos back then, right? Yes. Yeah. They um, and they would have shills. They'd have the people that would say they they'd have no record, so they could be the general manager. But the people behind the scenes was either uh, it was Chicago, Kansas, uh, Kansas City, or or Florida mob and. Um, and they actually, I, I told you, they, they ran a pretty good business. The, yeah. the food was good. It was cheap. And, uh, <laughs> and, but they didn't want to pay taxes. They were doing white-collar crime. They were, they were skimming and mm. not paying federal, federal taxes. Did you ever get a chance to uh, interview any of those guys or interrogate? Um, no, t well, there was one, one old guy that was a, he was a, a cat burglar from San Francisco, and he was used to to set up a $1.7 million jackpot mm. in Tahoe. And my partner and I, we, got, we, we were shifting every, every two weeks. We would watch him, and then uh, we had a chance to talk to him. But, oh. but he was part of organized crime, but he was on a lower level. Yeah. And, um, but generally, when we, when, when we got to that point, if we, as, as a game control, which we controlled the state, um, once we got it to where it was certain that it was a federal crime, then the feds would come in. Mm. And we do our witness statements, and, and they would take it and go from there, because that's where the that's where the leverage was, mm. getting it for tax evasion and all that. Yeah, yeah. Um, as you're as you're uh, you know working all these assignments, you know San Diego police uh, probate investigator, uh, and then with the casinos, um, uh, did you ever link back up with uh, uh, any vets? Um, you know. A lot of vets, you know, we talk about the camaraderie and stuff like that um, being hard to find uh, once you transition out. Um, how was it for you? Um, I had my the last partner I had when I got wounded in, in Way, Jeff Clifford. We communicated. He came up and spent some time um, where I was living, but never continued the dialogue. Um, and there was another one um, that uh, he became, he was with the... Um, Securities and Exchange Commission as an investigator. Mm. Tim Dunn, he was Irish from New York, mm. and he and I had done some stuff in Vietnam together. Nice. And we chatted, but uh, everybody was out of, out of uh, geographic location for me. Yeah. And as time went on, you know, I, 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 was, I, had, I had another one, or oh, the partner I had when I was on Operation Medina, Rod Lewis, he wanted to connect, and it ended up that he'd gone through three marriages, and he had, uh, really sad, had real serious medical issues and, emo wow. and emotional issues, very severe. Wow. And I chatted with him on phone. He lived in Washington. Mm. And, uh, did your, uh, did your guys' unit or anything uh, ever throw any type of reunions? Um, no. Yeah, no. I just asked, because I know now, like, you know, uh, my unit has a Facebook page. I know there's a lot of, you know, military units uh, with Facebook pages and they throw these yearly reunions and stuff. It, uh, you know, it's pretty cool to get back with uh, everybody that you served with, obviously, yeah. and yeah. go back and shoot the shit. You guys didn't, never did any of that. No, right? in our era, we, we, there were no cell phones. It was dial-a-phone. Yeah. And uh, no contact in, in that fashion. And, and being in the platoon I was with, I wasn't with a lot of the guys in the platoon. I was with my partner at the mm. time. And then we'd be out in the field but we really weren't absolutely connected to the battalion or to the company we were with. Right. So it was a great relationship. It, it was for battle. I mean, it, it was um, we needed each other. They liked what we did, yeah. and the and the colonel liked our intelligence we brought back. So really, there was. I know a lot of guys in, in the Vietnam group I'm with, um, like the Airborne. Mm -hmm. They have their annual um, get-togethers in Vegas or mm -hmm. or Florida and all that. We, we didn't. Yeah. And I imagine you weren't attached to the platoon because you were a scout sniper, right? So you were just with the, how many people would you go recon with? Usually it was a smaller group. It would be at least, there would be probably four others. Okay. Four others, but it'd be my partner and I'd be the scout and myself and, and four others. And uh, just strictly some assigned mm -hmm. reconnaissance, some we, they, what they heard and then just you know, just get into a spot where you can observe, see if there's any foot traffic. Yeah. And uh, it, a lot of times it wasn't for a shot, it, it was for reconnaissance. Yeah. We, didn't have re we didn't have recon in our area. Mm. They may have been in different locations. Um, RJ, what do you do uh, uh, now to, to 
mitigate like the uh, I don't know emotional response from everything that you've been through you know earlier you mentioned when you got out you just stayed busy you're going to school you're playing baseball and all that uh is there anything that you do now to uh to help all that yeah uh several things one i i go to the gym i i can't run but i can do the treadmill i can walk mm -hmm. and i do some dumbbells and i do i don't do free weights i do the ones just you plug the number in mm -hmm. Uh, three or four times a week. Um, but what's really been helpful is that I went to the uh, Combat Vet Center in Mission Viejo, mm. and uh, I've had several counselors there, but the most recent one is Dylan mm. Bender. Mm -hmm. And um, we have combat Vietnam veterans that meet in a park every Wednesday mm. at 11 o'clock. And that's been very cathartic because when I hear what the other guys are saying about their experiences, it's, it's bingo, that's, that's what I've gone through. And it, it makes me feel that I'm not the only one out there. And we know we're not, but right. it's nice to confirm it. So there's 10 to 15 guys that are saying this is how they've been affected. And we're, we're proud of each other because we look around and Dylan started, we're, 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 we're successful because we're alive still. Mm -hmm. And um, I think all of us are 100% yeah. you know, rated. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but we don't, no war stories, funny, st you know, the funny stuff, Yeah. you know, but not, not the trenches and, right. and we look forward to it. It's, it's been, it's very good. And I'm a Christian and I, and I have church, I have God. That's awesome. Is that the group? Cause Dylan, uh, he was telling me that sometimes he takes groups out and goes like kayaking or paddle boarding and stuff like that. Is that what you do? Yeah. We have access to that. Yeah. Okay. Go down to Dana point and I know uh, some of the leaders at the at the center. Uh, I, I went on some long hikes. We had six. There were a series of six hikes. Me and another one of the old guys went. Mm. But they're very supportive. Yeah. I mean, the guys and these are all these are combat veterans. These are guys that have gone through and they're doing counseling. Dylan wasn't in combat, but he was a marine and yeah. is a marine and yeah. and um, just aces. Recon marine too. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. He was he was trained to do the big stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dylan's a good good guy. I'm glad I, I'm glad I've met him. Um, well, we're getting ready to wrap it up. Um, any last words? Uh, no, yeah, I, I, you know, I think what, what you're doing, Josh, um, um, at a minimum will expose um, stories that other people that will see, veterans possibly, that say, well, there's someone like me, and if you've got 80 or 90 of those, or hundreds of them, it's nice to know that you're not alone, mm -hmm. and the younger guys are having the biggest problem with their experiences. The suicide rate, according to Dylan, is just skyrocketing out of Pendleton. Um, the guys that uh, had gone to school for training combat that didn't get assigned, but their buddies went and a couple got killed, those guys are having um, just severe disappointment, you know, and, and uh, Dylan has a term for it, I can't recall, but it's, I can understand why. Yeah. But I, I'm, I appreciate the opportunity to tell a little bit of my story yeah. And, uh, and I'm just, um, we're blessed to have someone like you that's going to, you know, put it out on, on YouTube and whatever means you can. Yeah. Yeah. And help other, help other vets. Yeah. Well, uh, I thank you for, for coming and taking a seat. Uh, it's a big deal, you know, especially with you Vietnam vets, you know, <laughs> the uh, old guys. Uh, yeah. A lot, a lot of, a lot of the, you know, Vietnam vets and it takes a little bit more, um, uh, energy out of me to get them to sit down and talk, you know. Uh, but you know, once, once we get to know each other and stuff like that, and they realize, hey, I'm a Marine vet myself, it's I think that makes it a lot, whole lot easier than than uh, you know, a non-military or, or yeah, a veteran yeah, and yeah, stuff yeah. like that. Absolutely, you you you're one of us. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, you know. We looked up to you guys, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I mean, how many times have, uh, you know, we've heard it in plenty of interviews, you know, uh, we've probably watched Full Metal Jacket a hundred times before even going into boot camp, you know? Yeah. Um, so uh, it's a real honor to, to, to have you here, RJ. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm sure you're going to impact a lot of people. I pre it's my pleasure, Josh. And anything I do to help you, let me know. Thank you, sir. Push it to the limit, I can't go no more. Red light, no way I'm coming back home. Long dirt road.